Welcome to This Organized Life. If you're a mom, wife, or coffee lover seeking advice on how to reduce clutter and reclaim time, look no further than your host, Lori Palau, founder of Simply Be Organized and author of Hot Mess, A Practical Guide to Getting Organized. For a lot of people, clutter is their dirty little secret, but it doesn't have to be. Each week, we will share practical tips, chat with experts, and provide strategies on how to keep you organized. I hope that by sharing our stories, you feel a little less alone and more empowered to tackle the areas that are holding you back. So let's get started. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of this Organized Life podcast. I am your host, Lori Palau, and I'm so happy that you're here. If you are just joining our show, welcome. Make sure to click the subscribe or follow button wherever you're listening or watching. And you are here in the middle of a series that we're doing. So you don't need to go back. You can, you can go back afterwards and listen. You don't need the first couple episodes in order to listen to today's episode. But just to bring you up to speed, if you are brand new to our show, we're doing a whole series about the five clutter pitfalls, specifically how each one of those relates to Enneagram types. So we're talking about procrastination, which we covered already, indecision. And then today we're going to be talking about guilt and fear. So those two kind of go hand in hand. And when I first developed the framework, I just had it as guilt. But the longer that I did this, I started realizing that there's this very fine line between guilt and fear in people's relationships, specifically when it comes to having that emotional stronghold of, should I get rid of things? Should I not get rid of things? And having that kind of that internal struggle within themselves. As we've gone deeper into looking at the Enneagram and the framework, how it can connect the dots to clutter and organization is something that we've been working on. And today we're specifically talking in about how the Enneagram fits into those specific areas. And I have a great guest for you. So if you happen to be an Enneagram enthusiast or junkie and you follow Enneagram uh, um, handles on Instagram or TikTok or wherever, you are probably familiar with my guest because joining me is Steph Barron Hall. And Steph has started the Instagram page, Nine Types Co. back in 2017, which is when we first launched this podcast. And since then it's grown to, uh, I don't even know how many, like hundreds of thousands of followers she has, but it was really, and she's going to share her story away for her to learn a little bit of, or kind of share her own Enneagram knowledge. And like I said, it's grown into this huge platform. And she now has a podcast uh, talking about the Enneagram. And we're going to touch on that. And she has a book called The Enneagram in Love, A Roadmap for Building and Strengthening Romantic Relationships. Um, she's an Enneagram coach. So I figured she would be a fabulous guest to have on this particular episode to talk about clutter, fear, guilt, and the Enneagram. So without further ado, let me welcome Steph Baron Hall to the show. Hi, Lori. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, I am excited as well. So I gave a real kind of broad stroke introduction to everybody here, but in your own words, can you just tell us a little bit about who you are? Sure. Um, so I think, you know, when you think of like career, which I guess this, this is like my type, you know, when I, uh, talk about myself, I probably do focus a little bit on, on my career. Um, so I'm an Enneagram at three and I work with a lot of people who want to use the Enneagram in a really practical way, like the application aspect of it. And I also work with a lot of teams and organizations. Um, I go in and, help people understand their type um, and understand their communication style in particular. I've found that that's one of the most um, like powerful and, and really impactful applications um, for teams because, you know, we all need to know how to communicate better. I think that's like most of our problems at work, right? Absolutely. I, not just at work. I think just in general with, in our marriages, with parent, child, just friend relationships, I think, communication. And that's so much about what we do here is really look at how that breakdown of communication or misfire of communication when it comes to dealing with organization and clutter can really be the caveat for bridging that gap. 
Yeah, absolutely. And so I think a lot of what I, I want to bring to the table is not just the theory of the Enneagram, which I enjoy looking at and I have, you know, three Enneagram certifications, right? So, um, and, and one of them is actually quite extensive. It took like two years to complete, uh, very extensive. Um, but not just about the theory, but like, how do we make it practical? You know, how do we, um, actually think about it in all these different contexts, which is why, you know, the guilt and fear concept makes sense. Um, because our type shows up in all these different ways. Absolutely. And I love that because I, again, I, I talk about that here as well, where, knowing your type is great, but really what are you going to do with that? What are you doing with that information? So mm-hmm. it's like the, so, so what, or so that you can do something, you know, it's more than just like a party conversation starter. It's right. how can you apply this tool, this framework into the work that you're doing in any aspect? Again, we're specifically applying it to clutter organization, all of that, but in any way, in any facet of your life. And I I think that we love that. How did you first discover the Enneagram? Tell us your Enneagram journey story. Yeah. So actually I have always really been interested since I was a kid in like personality typing things. Like I remember seeing this quiz. It was like, if your favorite color is orange, it means this about you, et cetera. Um, But I was working in an organization where we used a different motivation-based system called a total SCI. I think that the name is different now, but, um, it it was motivation based, which I loved as compared to like Myers-Briggs and some of the other ones that I'd used previously. And so one day I came home, my husband was like, Oh, you have to check out the Enneagram. I heard about it on the podcast. Like here's my type, whatever. I was like, yeah, that's cool. Okay. You know, kind of brushed it off. I was like, I'm really focused on this other thing over here. And then a few months later, my older sister, was like, what's your type? And I was like, oh, I don't know. Like, I'm not into it. And um, she's like, you have to take the assessment and like, you have to do what your older sister says, right? (laughs) So I took it and uh, I was like, oh, okay. You know, it makes sense. Um, And so that was like my first introduction. And of course popped up, said the achiever. And I was like, yes, I won. And then pretty quickly, started reading more. And I was like, Oh no, I, I do not like this. I feel very exposed. Um, and that just kind of set me off on this journey. Yeah. And what year was that? Like, how long ago was that? That was, I think that when I took the assessment, it was like 2016. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I was, and I was a little bit behind you cause I was probably the end of 2017 when I was first introduced in similar, like People had told me about it and I was like, what is this? I don't even know what this is, but um, it is, it is fascinating. And the more that we've started applying it here, people are just like, I, you know, I never really thought about my relationship with stuff or my time in the same context. So I I love that. Um, As I said, at the top of the episode, we, before I even learned about the Enneagram, I taught about identifying three main types of clutter, physical clutter, which is the stuff that you see your emotional clutter, which has to do with that guilt and fear could be sentimental stuff. It could be money-based. It could be so-and-so handed this down, whatever that is, but it's that roadblock is how I think of it. That gives you that pause from taking action. And then you have calendar clutter and emotional clutter could also just be the guilt. Like I have to say yes to everything. So it doesn't always have to be guilt and fear over physical things. It could also be guilt and fear over obligations and things that we feel like we have to say yes to for a variety of reasons. And so I've talked about the three types of clutter and five clutter pitfalls for years. And that's kind of, I've used it as a, to provide language and context for people. But then once the Enneagram entered the picture for me and the work that we're doing, it added a whole other layer to this crazy onion to be able to say, well, looking at our Enneagram types, knowing that there are so many different facets of the Enneagram, our orientation to time, our dominant and repressed centers, all of these different things that could play in you and I offline talked, touched upon subtypes, which we haven't really dove into on this 
show yet, but the, again, it's not a one size fits all, like not all threes look the same. Not all eights look the same. Everybody has their own nuances depending on where they are, um, you know, in their life. And so again, I think it's really interesting to approach it from a variety of different aspects. So I wanted you to come on today to just talk about from your perspective and, and teach us um, a little bit about each of the Enneagram types and how they may present themselves when it comes to that guilt fear component of clutter and organization. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had a hard time with this prompt only because I was thinking, well, one, not everyone struggles with clutter, but then of course I was like, okay, let me make this rule. I'm only talking about the people who do struggle with it. Cause automatically when I start to talk about this, I'm like, my brain goes into, oh, you're going to have these, all these people who are like, I don't struggle with that. It's not, that's not my thing. I'm like, no, let's narrow. Like what, <laughs> what's the container? Well, let me, let me actually, let me just put a pin in that for a second because we've done time. And my husband happens to be a three also. So I, again, not all threes look alike, but I've, I've studied a lot about threes just because relationally learning about the difference between threes and eights, even though there's some similarities, it can also be very combative. Um, what is your personal relationship with clutter? Maybe we could just talk about that before we dive into it, because I find threes typically have a very specific response when we talk about that or when I bring up the topic. Okay. I'm so curious to hear what that is. <laughs> um, but I think a big thing for me is like to backtrack, like in life in general, like I love it when I place my errands in the exact you know, way where I never have to drive back on the same road. Like I go in a circle, like my husband is like, oh my gosh, can you please just, you know, no, I I, I don't like to backtrack. So I don't want to buy the same thing twice. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I end up having clutter because it, it's like, it, it can even be guilt, right. Uh, about buying the same thing twice or, um, like, oh, I used to have that thing, but I don't need more. And I, you know, now I can't or, or, or that sort of thing. Um, so that's a big thing for me. I also tend to have a lot of clutter in the sense of like usefulness. Um, like I have a ton of books. Like I have. So does my husband. So He's such books. a big reader. Mm -hmm. But they're they're org like they're organized. He just that's that's one thing that he struggles with getting rid of his books. Yeah. I would say. Yeah, because it's you, right there. does physical clutter. I'm going to kind of give you a leading question here. Yeah. Um, like your physical space is, is physical clutter a thing for you? Or do you, how do you feel about like, if you walk in a room that's disorganized, it has piles of paper, things out of place. Yeah. Does I that, don't like that. Yeah. So do not like it. <laughs> so every three that I've ever spoken to, and I'm sure there's one that doesn't fit into this mold, but every three that I've ever spoken to has a like a visceral reaction when it comes to clutter. Like they really, they could feel like their their stress level rise. They could feel their cortisol rise. They could, you know, they don't like that appearance of physical clutter in a space. So having it out of sight is more important to them. Mm -hmm. um, I know in my husband's case, it's more important to put it away or just get it out of sight than put it away properly. Like to, he just wants it away. Mm. And so I'll be like, where did you put that? And now obviously we have very defined spaces for things. So I've trained him well, but <laughs> a lot of times he's like, I don't know, because he's so, it's so intuitive for him to just mindlessly put it away because he doesn't want to see it that he isn't always thinking about where it's, where it is or where it's landing. So when you go to look for it, he winds up wasting more time because the retrieval process is not as efficient, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It does. And I think that like, there are definitely times when I'm like cleaning something out and I'm like, why would I put this here? I know <laughs> that I have all these things over here, but I will say that if I put something away somewhere, I normally like can say, oh, it is right here. However, there are times, and this is like, maybe it's just like an ADHD brain thing. Well, where... he's got that too. So we, we did a whole series on that. 
<laughs> yeah. Like I, uh, recently my husband was like, where is the other ice tray? And I was like, in the freezer, he's like, no. And I was like, that's weird. I know I got ice earlier. Like, where is it? Could not find it anywhere. Okay. Did it ever turn up? It was in the bottom drawer, like the, like the cheese drawer type area of our <laughs> fridge. Go figure. Like, like I didn't even get anything out of that drawer. Why did I put the ice tray there? <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's the, sometimes these things happen. It's so funny. Yeah. I, again, I've got, my husband and my daughter both have ADHD and some of the things that, is it Enneagram? Is it ADHD? Is it a combination? Who knows? Yeah. Um, but when you talk about, you know, when I kind of set you the, the, the talking points, the questions, I love how you mentioned, you know, not everybody struggles. And I think about that's part of the reason why I'm so intentional about defining different types of clutter, because there are people that do not struggle with physical clutter, right? That is not a pain point for them. They're like, I'm fairly organized, but I, I look at clutter in a much broader spectrum where it's not just the stuff. It could be, I feel the need to control everything. My time is constantly, I have no margin in my schedule. I'm constantly saying yes to things I shouldn't be saying yes to, or overextending myself. And that is a form of clutter in in my world as I'm defining it. And so I think when we look at it in that context, we could say that there are different types of clutter that people struggle with that go beyond what we would naturally just think about when you think about clutter and organization. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, even in, in that sense, I think as a three, I always think I have more time or I can do things quicker than I actually can. So I'll be like, oh, I'm going to do this big thing. Like I'm going to migrate like uh, my learning platform where my courses are stored. Oh, but this one isn't perfect. So let me migrate it again. And it's just like, it's exhausting, you know? Yeah, I I definitely think, but I have seen threes have an innate ability to get things done efficiently beyond some of the other types. So I do think that you have that, superpower in your favor. But like you said, you have to be careful not to allow that to almost become cocky where you think you can do all of the things mm -hmm. within, you know, a specific time frame. Yeah, so we don't love... like hearing, hmm, is that really reasonable or like realistic to expect yourself to be able to do all of these deliverables in a week? And I'm like, don't ask me that question. <laughs> Well, yeah, because you guys are, you guys are achievers and that's yeah. it. And, and that is, you know, and so much of the worth of, you know, the false narrative is that your worth is tied to your work. So of course you're going to show up mm -hmm. armed and ready to go. Yeah. So, all right. So I'm going to allow you to kind of walk us through in whatever way is comfortable for you. We've had people want to teach this kind of chronologically, We've got te people teach it kind of by your triads, however you want to approach this, but I'd love for you to just kind of go through and maybe walk through each of the types. We don't have to go super deep into each one because this is a show that's under an hour, but just give some, you know, indication and perspective about how each of the types characteristics could potentially affect the relationship when it comes to the guilt and fear. Yeah. Um, and I think th the big thing I also was thinking about this is like how much our family of origin, childhood, other experiences, I'm sure you've talked about that a lot. Absolutely. But when I hear guilt and fear, even in my own life, I'm like, oh, scarcity. Right. So like, mm. I was kind of thinking where, it, where does that come in for the types? Um, and normally I do start with type eight. Cause I like to teach by the intelligence centers, but today I'm starting with type one and you'll see why, uh, later. Um, so for type one, I, I just thought about like how they always, it, it's almost like having too much to do in the sense of like, there's this really strong drive to want to be able to get it all done just right. So if a one can't complete things to the extent necessary, there can be this like kind of thing, like why even start? Totally. We've talked about that so much here. Absolutely. And I think perfectionism is driven in a lot of ways by fear. Mm -hmm. Um, 
of like that sense of inadequacy. And I was just working with somebody recently who said, you know, as a one, they're, they're practicing this thing of like, just doing a little at a time. And I think that's a huge growth for ones. A hundred percent. I was actually, when I was, I always, prior to learning the Enneagram would teach, just do, if you have 15 minutes, because a lot of my listeners, followers, clients are busy folks, men and women, but a lot of them are, you know, they're moms, they're juggling a million things and you don't have all day to dedicate to a project. Most of us don't. I know I don't in my own life. <laughs> and so you kind of steal those moments when you have them. Like if you have 15 minutes, just do a little bit at a time. And once I started incorporating the Enneagram, I had this light bulb moment specifically as it pertained to ones. And I was doing this focus group and I interviewed a bunch of ones and I said, what does that elicit to you? And they're like, that is like nails on a chalkboard to be able to think about starting something that I could not finish. And I, again, because I see the world through my own lens, never factor that in that that could actually in and of itself be a roadblock to ask them to do something so outside their comfort zone. Yeah. Yeah. And I think too, when we think about the emotional clutter or like the obligations aspect, I've heard one say, why would you ever say yes to something that you weren't absolutely certain that you could do? And so one, that that can be a bit of a criticism, right? But it can also be something that they carry really heavily on themselves. Like if they say, if they say, I'm going to do this and everything goes up in the air and things change, they might have a really hard time actually revisiting that and saying, you know what? I'm actually not going to be able to do that. I don't have capacity. I can't do it. That could be tough. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Let's talk about twos. So I think this is like probably very expected, you know, twos go the sentimental objects, right. Um, or the things that have like some sentimental value or especially a gift that they've gotten from other people. Um, like there can be guilt around rejection or around, you know, saying like, Oh, I'm going to get rid of this thing that this other person gave me. Um, because it can almost be like a representation of love or care or connection. Absolutely. Yeah. I think there's so many, any of the types in the heart. Well, I, but I, I see it less with threes, but twos and fours specifically, I think it's something that I, I absolutely have seen firsthand be yeah. a big, a big driver. So yeah. And God, no, no. Feel again, free. like the, the calendar thing too, though, I think twos have a hard time a lot of the time with their calendars. Absolutely. Oh, you need a meal. You need me to pick up your kids from soccer practice. Oh, you need me to volunteer for this. Yes, 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 yes. So that is a big practicing that no is a complete sentence. Cliche mm -hmm. is, is a real struggle for twos. Yeah. And I think one thing that twos kind of are devaluing with that is like their own sense of like internal peace or calm or self-care, right. That can be, um, they can feel guilty if they're like, well, I could have done that. And it's like, yeah, but it's important for you to be able to just chill on the sofa for a second. Absolutely. Yeah. There is a lot of guilt around having that. And I think for more than, more than just choose, but specifically, I think that is something that, you know, again, choose have a hard time putting their oxygen mask on first, I think. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and we've already talked about threes a little bit, but um, I also think that threes, like, and maybe this is just for me, but I don't like to buy a new thing if the one that I have still works. Really? Mm -hmm. I think that's interesting. Okay. That one's, I did not expect. That does not apply to clothes or shoes. Or oh, well, that's why I was saying, items. okay. That's where I was going. Because I was like, my husband is really big into like, he's a sneakerhead and likes new things and even technology. He likes to be on the cutting edge. Now, he will cycle out. He doesn't have, he'll get rid of the other stuff. The only thing, like I said, that he struggles with is, is really books, but like clothes, if he's like, oh, I'm bringing something new in, he has no problem getting rid of the old, but um. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what not, are you specifically talking about? Like, can you give a tangible example? Um, let's see, for example, a phone, right? Like my phone came out in 2019 
it's not stellar anymore. Okay. Let's be real. It's not great. Uh, it sometimes takes like a full second to load something like it's definitely like a, a hardware issue, not like a software issue. I've done all the things you're supposed to do, but I'm like, I just don't want to buy a new phone <laughs> or, um, like, I, I don't know. My husband, and I have this disagreement sometimes, but like buying things for the house where I'm like, but this one still works. It's just like not as nice and optimized as that, but this works. So it's a very practical side. Yeah. Very practical side. What is your husband's type, by the way? So he has had a, the hardest time finding his type, but he actually recently, you know, six months ago or so decided he's a, a four, one to one four. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think especially a lot of one to one fours I've met can have like this level of intensity that in some ways they seem eight ish or even one ish at times. Um, so that's definitely true for him. Interesting. I love it. We're actually going to take a break here. Um, and then we're going to come back and we'll pick up with the fours and we'll continue on learning all about the different types and how they can relate to guilt and fear. So sit tight. Um, all right. So we've covered one's the perfectionist, two's the helpers, three's the achievers. Now let's talk about fours, the individualist, romantic, whatever you, there's multiple names for a lot of these types. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious so your fours, take on this. Yeah. So I think fours, like they kind of like twos, they go for the nostalgic objects. So something that has like that sense of like story, um, or something really meaningful that can be really difficult to get rid of. It feels a little bit like they're getting rid of their past mm -hmm. in a sense. Um, so I've seen that a lot with fours or, um, especially things that are like little unique, they'll have like a, a lot of one-off things. Um, for example, my husband recently got this little, uh, mug that has, um, he loves mugs. Okay. That's like his, he, he loves like sets of mugs. I'll just say that in general, he'll find them at Goodwill. They're really unique. He loves like to have matching sets of unique, like, well, that's the individualist, like finding yeah. that vintage. I think it's that whole, like you said, something from history, something that has a story. I could see that the, something that's different. Yeah. Yeah. So he has all these lower like one off. So they're either full sets, like a set of four, or it's like a one-off that's really special and unique. Um, so things like that. And there can be, I think sometimes guilt getting rid of something like that versus, um, something that is like mass manufactured that might not be as much of a guilt thing for a four to get rid of. Yeah, I could see that. Um, do you, I'm just curious if you notice, I know this isn't necessarily kind of under the guilt and fear, but since your husband is a four, I've noticed because of that whole that storytelling component to a lot of fours personality type. Um, I give them more space to go through the decluttering process or they, because I feel like a lot of fours require that because they need to really work through the process slower than other types who might be quicker processors or quicker decision makers, or not have to necessarily go back and get to a point of like working through it. So, and I'm wondering if you've noticed that in terms of how your husband is. So like something that might take me 10 minutes might take a four, 20, 30 minutes because they have to kind of go through, I wore this t-shirt at this concert and it reminds me of this and they need to kind of tell that story as part of the getting rid of process. Yeah. You know, I think that's not so much the case for him. Like he's done this thing where he'll be like, I'm going to wear only black t-shirts from now on takes, gets rid of everything else in his closet. <laughs> when I'm like, can we not do that? Cause like you might decide in a couple of weeks that you're not going to wear black t-shirts all the time. And now you're going to want to buy new clothes. So <laughs> that's not, uh, so he, it's not, he doesn't really have as much of an issue. I mean, he, he works quickly in general. Um, but I could imagine for is having a, a difficult time with that. Um, he doesn't, he doesn't have clutter except for disc golf stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. That's so funny. Well, and, yeah. and tell him if he wants to wear black and that's all he's going to wear is black t-shirts just, and I don't know what your house looks like in terms of space, but 
take all the other stuff and just put it in a bin. Don't get rid of it right away. Because like you said, that phase may last six months and then you're like, oh wait, let me go incorporate yeah. some color. So he does that now. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, go ahead. Yeah. And then I think with fives, it's really interesting because I think fives don't like to produce waste. Correct. So fives, I would say it, the guilt and fear comes more in like, it's not okay to consume more. It's not okay to like have like this revolving door of like stuff that I'm bringing in and out. So they might just keep what they have. That's what I see. I see them going, I don't want to have to rebuy this. I don't want to have to spend the money. I don't want to have to use my time and energy to have to actually go out and physically get something else. I would rather just hold on to this, even if they might not need it for five years or who knows when. So yeah. they would rather hold on to the, the, what could be something that they're not using and which I would deem as clutter in exchange for the possibility that they might need it someday. Yeah. And I think too, there's like the, the real fear of emptiness and depletion for fives. Mm -hmm. Um, so if they are get rid of something that's like theirs, that can, that might be difficult. Um, and then sixes, I think that they like to have everything they possibly could need. Right. You're, oh, interesting. So you think they just want options? I think, I think sixes. So I actually know some sixes who do not have any clutter and they're like, get rid of it. Like in general, I think sometimes head types might have an easier time with that. But when sixes do have clutter, it's like, well, I might need that. I mean, I might need that one day. They can think of a scenario in which whatever specific thing it is might come in handy. Yes. I see sixes deal a lot more with the fear. So then the guilt, when we look at that kind of in that clutter pitfall, where it's a lot of times the sixes, I find they don't trust themselves. So they need that reassurance from somebody like I'll be working with a client and they're coming to the conclusion. I'm just reinforcing it or reiterating it or giving them and I'm air quoting, giving them permission that it's okay to get rid of that. And that will allow them the freedom to feel good about their decision but they often don't necessarily trust their decision to do that. And it's more like, okay. And they'll, again, as those worst case scenario thinkers, mm -hmm. they could go down a fear spiral. Yeah. They can just think that like, I'm afraid I won't have this when I need it or if I need it, mm -hmm. um, that can be hard. And I think of sixes, uh, one of my friends who's a six says opposite case scenario. And I really like that. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah. Cause a, a lot of the time I think it's not always worst case, right? Yeah. Cause they'll play devil's advocate to anything, even if it's a, a you know, a bad thing. Yeah. I'll do that as an eight. <laughs> um, I'm a big <laughs> devil's advocate person, but we're, we'll get there in a minute. Yeah. So I'm curious what your, what your thoughts are with sevens with regards to guilt and fear, because it's not what I would intuitively two words that I would use to describe a seven. Yeah. Though I think that sevens do have a deep underlying fear, you know, as, as part of the head triad. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've, I've just seen a lot of sevens be the opposite where they don't care and find cleaning out to be really easy because they can just mentally distance themselves. They don't get emotionally attached. Um, I think that sometimes if sevens go the opposite direction and have, um, more clutter, it's normally because of the sentimentality aspect. Like, especially if you think of like the one-to-one -one subtype type seven. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I I've seen a lot of seven just kind of be like, no, I don't feel guilty. Like I just get rid of it. Um, and to the extent that sometimes family members are like, what, where is all the things, that, you know, we had growing up or whatever. Um, so that that's been more something that I've noticed. I think the guilt and fear can come from like fearing being weighed down. Mm. by stuff. Yes. Yes. I like that. Yeah. I also have seen a lot of sevens 
have more guilt over the, like the money that they've spent on things. So mm-hmm. I ha- I remember having one client where they had tons and tons of hobbies. So they went through this, like, I'm going to learn how to make beer. Then I'm going to learn how to make cheese. And I'm going to learn how to do this. So, and every time they learn, you know, took up a new hobby or new interest, they bought all the things for it. So there's mm-hmm. all the accoutrements. And when you think about that, is that that not only takes up real estate and space, but that also is a reminder of the money that you spent. And yeah. once that like ship sails and you're like, I'm not interested in this hobby anymore, that physical stuff remains. And I've seen people struggle with getting rid of it because they're like, I really spent a lot of money on all of this, mm-hmm. you know, whatever it was. And so I feel guilty just getting, donating it or getting rid of it. Yeah. And obviously that can apply for any. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And what I tell people is like, oh no, go ahead. I'm sorry. (laughs) Uh, No, I mean, it's just unfortunate that like, you know, all these things that we collect, then we don't need them, but it's not like you can resell them and get your money back. (laughs) And I try to tell people when they're struggling with that. And I, and I appreciate the fact that people aren't, that, that they have a conscience and aren't feeling wasteful. Like, oh, it's fine. Who cares that we spent all this money? Who cares that we're taking up all this real estate? So I applaud that sense of, you know, social responsibility or environmental responsibility, whatever it's going to find, whatever you're looking, talking about it. But what I tell people all the time is you holding on to it isn't going to recoup your money. It's not going to recoup your space. And every time you walk into that basement and you see your stuff that you're not using sitting on a shelf, or you walk in your closet and you see all that stuff that you're not wearing, it is a reminder. And then we put on these, again, guilt, fear, shame, hats that affects us, whether we realize it or not. And so- Hopefully, maybe we think twice moving forward before we do this, asking yourself questions about things, but don't continue to beat yourself up every time you walk in that closet and stare at those shoes, you know, that you're not wearing anymore because you spend a lot of money and they kill your feet. It's just let it go. Yeah. Yeah. Let it go. Um, let it go. So then we All have right. eights and I'm curious yes. to hear about you, your perspective on eights, but uh, Cause I was thinking, you know, similar to sevens, I think a lot of eights be really cut and dry and be like, nope, you know, I'm not using this. I'm, I'm going to get rid of it. And in general, I've, I've seen eights resist the concept of guilt or even like guilty pleasure. Like if you say like one, I think I had something on Instagram that talked about eights, you know, watching their guilty pleasure TV show. And I, I had an A comment, which I totally see this. And I've heard this from multiple eights, but they said, yeah, I watch Real Housewives, but I don't feel guilty about it. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. I don't, I don't have guilt about that. I, emotional clutter in general is not something that I tend to struggle with. Calendar clutter. Yes. So my stuff isn't as much when it comes to like, I'm very black and white when it comes to, this is something that was sentimental. That was my kids. They, it has a defined space for here's our bin for our keepsakes. And they have that. So it's not that every single thing has gotten rid of. There's a place for that, but I'm very methodical when it comes to cycling in and out. Now that could also be an occupational hazard. I've worked that muscle constantly. So it comes naturally to me, but, um, you know, my biggest thing would be, I guess, you know, calendar clutters where I struggle. So I don't really, but guilt and fear aren't, aren't necessarily the, the predominant emotions that I struggle with as an eight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that they're just thinking about the other ones you have. I could imagine others being more, you know, driving for, for eights. Um, Shall we talk about nines? Yeah, I love talking about nines. Nines so are my think- favorite type. Oh yeah. If I could be it's a it if if I could be any type other than my own, I think I would want to be a nine. Yeah. I mean, I think that threes and eights both have this thought of like, I have to like almost earn the right to exist by being productive and effective and impactful all the time. And nines are like, I just exist. Like 
yeah, my older daughter's a nine and it's, I, I'm like, I, what, what would that be like? I would, I try to lean into my nine wings so much. I really yeah. do. So yeah, that's good practice. It's a, um, it is, it's a practice, but yes, let's talk about nines, the peacemakers. So I think again, like with twos, I think sentimental objects can be big for nines. Um, and like getting rid of things that have sentimental value can, can be really challenging, especially if like a person is going to come visit their house and might notice like, oh, that I don't have this anymore. Like they might just spend all of their time thinking about the other person's experience and not really thinking about their day-to-day lived experience of their own space, their own calendar, their own emotional life, et cetera. So I think that's a big thing for nines because they feel guilty about turning the spotlight back onto themselves. Yeah. I find it interesting because, because nines have this, you know, incredible superpower to, to really be able to see multiple sides to a scenario it even if they personally aren't struggling with like their own guilt like it means so much to me I think it's really more like how would that other person feel you know and sometimes when you have too many voices you don't know who to listen to and I think that could be paralyzing and and I so I could see I could see that for a nine. Um, and also I could see fear playing in because sometimes nines don't really always trust themselves, you know, or they're like, again, they don't really, they're like, well, what I, what I think might not matter as much to what somebody else thinks. Mm -hmm. And so I could see it, it weighing in and really looking at so many sides where, like you said, I could see you coming in and being like, nope, yes, no, whatever. It taking a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. The indecision can be hard. That indecision, absolutely, hundred mm-hmm. percent. I think three, six, and nine. I know that threes aren't typically seen as struggling with indecision, but I think the second that they start to lean on either arrow, that comes up. Yes. Um, so for all three of those types. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So. You know, again, for people that are familiar with the Enneagram and have done some work that are listening to this, you probably all of this is making sense. If you're newer to the Enneagram, some of the language that we used may be a little foreign to you. Um, I encourage you to go back and like either listen to some of our past episodes that we've done on the Enneagram. Obviously, check out Steph's stuff that she, um, because she's so eloquently breaks it down in very common sense language, which I love. It's not overly academic where you're like, what am I even trying to understand here? Um, And that's, that's really, you know, what our goal is to get people to understand the tools and apply them in common sense, everyday life. Yeah. Um, Any final thoughts that you want to share with our listeners about anything relating to the Enneagram dealing with clutter? Yeah. Um, Well, one is, I think when it comes to the Enneagram, like there are, there's a ton of information out there. Um, And I say like, try to get information from good sources. I'm sure that you have good sources, but normally going a little bit deeper, finding something not necessarily right on Instagram, (laughs) Uh, because a lot of the time you might find something, even, even people who read my stuff might be like, oh, I resonate with all of this. So you need to take a step back and and look at the types themselves, the type descriptions. Um, I think that's really important. Um, but when it comes to clutter, I think the other thing for me is like, even just noticing my own reactions to writing about this, um, this week, thinking about it, talking about it, even in like, I recently read a a fiction book about somebody who was um, a hoarder and I had this like really visceral like reaction to it. It was so uncomfortable. Um, and because I, I started getting really self-critical about it. So I think Mm. approaching it with self-compassion of being like, yeah, it makes sense why I felt the need to do this. Um, I think that's really important anytime we want to change anything. Absolutely. And again, I think that self-critical thing, we can all, there's so much shame. I always say that for so many people, clutter in whatever form it looks like 
is your dirty little secret. Like people don't want to talk about it. It's uncomfortable and they feel that they are less than. And so much of what we try to teach here is about the learned skills that you can use to apply and lean into what, again, there's so many variables, right? Your life experiences, your family of origin, other external factors, but also using where what your natural inclination is based on your Enneagram type and how you're using those gifts to work with you as opposed to trying to white knuckle your way and just say, force it to do it a certain way because this yeah. is how somebody else told you it should be done. Yeah. Yeah. So where, before we go to our last break, tell our listeners, where can they find you, connect up with you? I know you have your own podcast. So Mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I have a podcast called Enneagram in Real Life and I interview people of all types. Um, I I need more ones and fives to come on. Good luck with the fives. Um, Fives are so hard to come by. (laughs) I know I have one fantastic episode, probably one of my favorites with a five and it's really, really great. Um, but if that's the only five episode you can find, definitely come listen to it. Uh, but I, I interview people about their lives and their work and, and how the Enneagram plays into all of that. Um, and so you can find it at Enneagram You'll also find, um, an Enneagram starter pack, which is basically my self-typing guide, plus um, a podcast episode that goes through and just like briefly describes each type. And I think that's really useful because it's good to hear it out loud. I think some people can read it and and adjust, um, but a lot of the time they need to hear it. I could not agree more. And yeah, we'll of course link up to all of that in our show notes on our podcast page. So we, I think that's great because yes, I think learning about it by listening and reading and self-discovery is the most effective way to really figure out who you are. So I love that. Um, All right. We're going to take a quick break. And then when we come back, we're just going to put you right back in the hot seat for a wrap of questions. So sit tight. Great stuff. This has been so fun. Um, I know you're a wealth of knowledge with all things Enneagram. And I really appreciate you coming in and talking about something that is probably not necessarily in your lane of Enneagram stuff, but looking at another way that we can apply this tool to in our own self-discovery. So thank you so much for that. Um, We always like to ask our guests a couple of different questions before we let them go. One of them has to do with books. And I know that you, um, I know that you're a reader, as you said, so this might be really hard or it might be really easy. Um, Is there a book or it could be a couple that either has been something that you go back to often, or maybe it's been really transformational or something that you're like, oh, I always refer, like recommend this book to other people. And if so, can you share what it is? I had a hard time with this question because I was like, I just can't even like, I need to go back and, you know, look at my library card, like, and, you know, audible (laughs) and everything. Um, but I'll just mention the two books that I read over the weekend. Um, so one is in the realm of hungry ghosts by Gabor Mate. Um, I actually was going to look up how to pronounce his name. Not sure if that's exactly right, but, um, he is a medical doctor and this is in the realm of hunger ghosts, a uh, close encounters with addiction. Um, and he talks about, um, the modern science of addiction. I mean, this book is now 17 years old, but, um, there's a lot in there that, that varies from what some of the, the con ways that people think about addiction. So, um, is really interesting and any kind of generalizes the concept of addiction beyond, you know, substances and into like other types of behaviors, which, you know, compulsions, things like that. Fantastic book. I really, really enjoyed it. I think, um, I want to say everyone should read it. I don't know. But yeah, read it but we'll say it. we're going to say we're going to, and yeah. we have a good reads list. So we're going to yeah. add it to our good reads list for all of our guests we have. So we'll make sure that we put that on there. And I will personally be checking it out because selfishly, this is why I asked this question. <laughs> I, know. I, I do the same thing. Uh, the other book I read was a uh, romantic comedy by Cur- Curtis Sittenfield. Oh. And it's basically a, uh, story that takes place at a place like SNL. Like if you oh. like 30 rock, mm-hmm. you would like this, this book. Um, and 
yeah, it's a novel. So it's, it's a fiction book about, um, a story unfolding in that context. I like that you read both fiction and nonfiction. Yeah. I think that's good. I tend, I, I have to intentionally practice reading more fiction. That's something that is, I will intuitively gravitate towards a nonfiction, a self-help, a, a biography or something of that nature. Going to fiction is just, again, I don't know. I think it may, and it has to probably do a little bit with that guilt where I feel like, well, I should be learning something. I should be taking something practical away, not just reading something for fun, which is ridiculous. Like it doesn't even make sense when I say it out loud. Yeah. But yeah, but, it makes sense when looking at our culture, it's like all about productivity, but yeah. what if we can lighten that up a little bit? So. I love it. I love it. And then our last two questions, we ask every guest, and this could be super serious or lighthearted, however you want. We know that some of us are organized and thriving in some areas and we're struggling and feeling like a bit of a hot mess in other areas. So right now in this particular season of your life, where do you feel that you are the most organized and where do you feel like you're a little bit of a hot mess? Well, I have to say, I, this is not what I like plan to say, but I'm like really, really good. Like I'm an A plus breakfast maker. Oh, whether I'm making a smoothie or like oatmeal, I eat steel cut oats a lot of the time. I make amazing breakfast. It's really great. It's like really healthy and balanced and everything. I am a C minus breakfast eater, meaning I don't actually eat the breakfast I've just made, or it takes me until 1 PM. And then I'm like, all right, let me finish this up so I can then go have lunch. Um, so just like out of left field, but yeah, I'm, I'm not good at doing the eating part of the breakfast. <laughs> That's funny. And again, most people are like, I'm an A plus eater and the rest of it can, you know, needs a little help. So that's pretty funny that you have it flipped, but yeah, I love that. Love a good breakfast. Love a good breakfast. Yeah. That is super funny. So I guess there we go. We have our hot mess and our organized all in one, <laughs> all in one breakfast. Yeah. Well, Steph, thank you so much. Um, can't wait to go check out your podcast. If you're ever looking for an eight guest, you know where to find me. I'm happy to return the favor and hop on your show and talk all good, bad, and ugly about Enneagram eights. But um, if this is your first time tuning into our show again, welcome. We really appreciate having you here. Click the subscribe button. If you feel so inclined to leave us a review, we really do appreciate it. And of course, share this episode with a friend. And we'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, I'm Lori Blount. Peace out. Thanks for tuning in. If you like this episode, please spread the love and share it with your friends. And if this is your first time joining us, make sure to click the subscribe button wherever you are listening so you never miss an episode. And while you're there, please leave us a review so other people know that our show is worth the listen. You can also find us on YouTube and Instagram at This Organized Life Podcast. And if you'd like to connect with us, you can head on over to our website at simply the letter B, like boy, organized.com, which is filled with tons of resources, including free downloads, checklists, links to our amazing organizing partners, and all of our digital offerings. I'll see you next week for another episode of This Organized Life.